Hi everyone. Today we have a really awesome discussions with professors Johannes Brandstetter and Eric Beckers about steerable EGNMs. And if you want to join these discussions yourself, you'll find all of the information in the description. So today we'll have geometric and phys physical quantities improved E3 equivalent message passing presented by Professor Brandstetter and Professor Beckers. And they work at the University of Amsterdam and the Johannes Kepler University. And the co authors are Rob Esslink, Lise Vanderpool, and Max Welling. So I'm sure we all have seen some fantastic papers from us all. Then, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I take the, the stage and start. Um, yeah, first, let me say thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think the goal of, of me and Eric um, is to, to really start the discussion today. Um, so in this paper, um, we basically ask ourselves a, a very fundamental question. And before like starting coming to this question, I will very quickly um, say how, how we like structured this. So I will give a, a short overview, which is about eight to nine slides with the most important concepts and also findings, because when we, we started this work, it was far from clear to us which difficulties we encountered in which direction is going in the end. And we can like at, at any moment start the discussion right away from, from, from there if there are questions, just, just shoot them at us. And like in the second part, Eric has prepared a very nice um, summary of framing different equivariant methods in one kind of framework, what they have in common, uh, like if they're regular or steer steerable con convolutions, and, and how they are implemented and so on and so forth. And this should like in this whole big zoo of, of E3 equivariant uh, architecture should like um, help a bit of, of understanding. And, and yeah, so, so uh, any like in, in any way if this is fine, we've of course also prepared some the code if, if, if we, want, we want to discuss the code, but in any case we are, yeah, we're prepared for, for, for the discussion in whatever direction they are going. Um, so with that said, let me start. There is a lot of literature now about equivariants, which means that, that putting um, a, a vector or a feature into a network and, and transforming it afterwards should, should give you the same as transforming it beforehand and, and then putting it through the ne network. What we were um, thinking of when, when, we, when the, the, the whole endeavor started about a year ago is that, that what happens if you have some vector or even tensor value quantities? Be because if you think in, in nature, especially in, in physics and chemistry, you have a lot of vector value quantities like force, acceleration, um, spin, angular momentum, and so on and so forth. So if you, if you have kind of some molecule structure here, but it doesn't have to be a molecule and we have some vector here attached, we want that, that if we put this, this, this uh, molecule-like structure through a network, and then transform it, it should be the same as, um, yeah, um, transforming it and putting it to the network afterwards. The, the, the thing is that with vectors, this is slightly a bit more complicated than, than just having some, some molecule structures where you have atoms and everything is, is scalar valued. So we want you to go to lift this to, to, to higher dimensions. And yeah, the, the, the motivation was, was really to to, to think that there is a lot of physics and a lot of chemistry out there and, and, and we want to, to, to make this, this, this really um, well-working concept of E3 equivariants, which Eric already explained is the equivalence with respect to, to um, 3D motions like rotations, translations and reflections, um, yeah, suitable for, for this kind of, of problems. And there is, uh, I think the biggest credit goes to the to the library of, of Mario Geiger and Tessa Schmidt and colleagues, um, which which is incredibly nice to work with, and which is was also like the, the big um, working horse behind our method. Um, so very loosely speaking, we work with steerable features, steerable vector spaces, and steerable MLPs. Um, but when for me, steerability is is, is defined as, as, as we can transform objects with, with vector matrix multiplication, which is if you think in, in the 3D space, if you, you have a vector and then you have a rotation matrix, this is a, you transform the vector with this rotation matrix. But if you go to higher dimensions, it's not so clear that everything transforms with 
this vector matrix multiplication. In fact, it, it doesn't work. So we, we have to go to a basis where this, this works and where this can be applied. And this is the, the basis, luckily, one can do this for, for rotations. Um, and this basis is spent by the spherical harmonics. So what we're doing, we, um, we, we project everything into the spherical harmonic basis and work in, in this basis where you can um, um, where you can do all this, um, these operations. And this um, one, one concept behind this is this, that we can work with so-called subspaces. So if you think of a, of a vector here, and if we encode this vector, this vector is encoded in, in, in different subspaces. So it has the, the zero order subspace, the first order subspace, the second order subspace, but it can also have higher order subspaces. And the, the transformations act on each of these subspace individually. And I think that the most important concept um, for me to understand was that this um, spherical harmonic embedding itself is equivalent with respect to, to rotations. What does this mean? So if you have a vector here, the vector X, and we embed it into spherical harmonics, so we embed this, this, this vector into um, this basis spanned by spherical harmonics. And I just realized that I forgot to, to say what spherical harmonics are. That's, that's my fault. Spherical harmonics are functions on the sphere, so that they're really defined um, on the sphere. And yeah, they're, they're very um, well known from, from physics. And basically, they are the, um, the angular so part of the solution when, whenever you, you encounter some, some um, problems which, which have some kind of Laplace operator in it. Okay, regarding that, uh, Johannes, can you go back to the opening or this equivalence slide where you see this nice graph with all these glyphs uh, on top of it? Yes. So what you see here, this is like, uh, okay, a graph with and usually you have feature vectors attached to each node. So at each node, you have some, uh, some vector. And now we have the same. It's just that this vector actually represents directional information. So that's what these glyph plots mean. It, it means, for example, red, it has some feature and value in this direction and perpendicular to it, it takes on a smaller value. And in the opposite direction, it takes a very negative uh, uh, value. And so with these spherical harmonics, we actually represent functions on the sphere at each node. And you should think of it at each node, we have features that have directional information in them. For example, I saw, I know, um, uh, some high energy or some attracting force from coming from this direction. And uh, maybe this, this uh, feature encodes for something else, like, uh, I don't know, some, some torsion uh, property or something that can be captured as directional information. So um, that, that's why it makes sense to think of spherical harmonics. Um, they, yeah, they, they, they are used to represent functions on a sphere. And now we should think of these feature vectors, these feature vectors that are attached to each node as uh, representing such a function on the sphere. So containing directional information. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> what I want to add. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, very, very well said. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks for that nice explanation. But in our case, couldn't we be using any other uh, type of function that maps from the the x that we want to encode to some higher dimensional space in an um, in an O3 equivariant way. So yeah, in, in that sense, I think the the uh, the sorry the, the spherical harmonics are to the best of, of, of my knowledge the only function which are really doing that. Ah, okay. So we so check yeah. this. Yeah, I, I suppose you could have a maybe different kind of representations for functions on the sphere, but the EREPs, it's like a Fourier basis on the sphere. So and a Fourier basis, it's a complete orthogonal or to normal basis even to represent such functions. So if you can expand signals in uh, spheric harmonics, you're good. You could pick another basis, but that basis could always be converted to a spheric harmonic basis. And actually this viewpoint of Fourier transforms, I think it's really useful. You see here on the left, this uh, this vector of uh, h values. So those should be thought of as the coefficients of your Fourier transform. And these glyphs that you see over here, or these spheric harmonics uh, functions, those are the corresponding, uh, let's say, sines and cosines or uh, the functions. And together, 
So if you sum them up together, yeah, you get a function on the sphere. And so this evaluation is like an inverse Fourier transform. And this is useful to think of it like that because then you can always convert such an abstract factor to some value. You can always evaluate its response in a certain direction, but there's no need to explicitly store this on a particular grid, but we just store, let's say the Fourier uh, coefficients. Yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, am I right in saying that the reason why we will or why we need those, they are just that we need a function that is that encodes our vector in an equivalent way yes. into whatever dimension we want. Yeah, and I think uh, maybe Jonas will explain it in one of the upcoming slides. Yeah, it's this one. Uh... Yeah, so so for me it was really uh, it was very good from my understanding. It, it's we have it also in the, in the appendix that, that the mathematics behind that why the um, embedding is equivariant so you can show that that if you have a vector and you embed it and after and then you rotate it gives the same as rotating the vector beforehand and then spherical harmonic embedding it yeah. and what are we rotating here molecules no, wave functions just a vector just a vector, a normal vector. Uh, what is what is this orange thing? Some blue and orange, uh, the drawings. The, the orange is the so 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 these are the the the, the spherical harmonic um, basis function, and so we use this vector. We encode this vector in this in this, this function of uh, this, in the space spanned by spanned by the spherical harmonic basis functions. Then we have this this object here. And then he, in, in, in that, so, and then if we apply a rotation, then we, yeah. you know, so, then we rotate so this object. Maybe I, I can add such a spherical harmonic as a function. So that this Y, yeah, it's really uncomfortable drawing with the mouse is a function from S2. In our case, we use real valued spherical harmonics. So to some real number. So that means for every, um, point on S2, so for every direction, we have some uh, response. And that is what these plots show. These are, you can call them glyph plots. It shows for every possible N, its value. Actually, so the, the, the length of so this blob is uh, given by the, uh, the, the absolute value of the norm and red colors then, uh, the color red to blue means if it's a positive or a negative value. Um, yeah, so for every different direction N, we can evaluate this function and it spits out the value. And this is a way of visualizing a function on the sphere. I think there um, are some other questions. Uh, yeah, Dominique. Uh, me. Yes, uh, so thank you for, uh, for the explanation. I would like to add uh, for some people that have maybe more physics background um, that uh, these spherical harmon harmonics are basically the solution to the Schrodinger's equation for a hydrogen atom. Um, and um, since the paper here is really motivated by molecules and uh, their, their 2D structures in, uh, in space, then basically what it looks here is um, how can we modify the normal orbitals that are known for the hydrogen atom to a multi-atom and multi-electron um, multi setting. So uh, there's, uh, there's also a very physics-inspired um, reasoning behind using the spherical harmonics and not just um, uh, and not just like uh, for the mathematics as well. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, and, and it's really cool. But in the, so in this paper, we do not directly link it to quantum mechanics or like uh, uh, these. these and really, I, I'm not a physicist, so I don't even know what I'm talking about when I talk about spin states, but or electron orbital uh, states. Um, this is really, for us, indeed, we use it primarily as a mathematical or a computational tool. And what, in our case, this represents is indeed some feature value given a certain direction. But initially, what this figure shows is if we have a direction vector, we can represent it as a function. So that's, uh, that's what this uh, illustrates, uh, which you can think of this direction is like a Dirac delta, Dirac delta uh, pointing at uh, a direction n and it's zero everywhere. And then if you expand it in a Fourier basis, uh, you get yeah these 
blob-like responses that point in that direction. And if you go up to increase more and more and more uh, higher frequencies, then it becomes sharper and sharper and becomes to uh, look like the, the actual arrow that you see over here. Um, yeah. But we, we use this to encode relative positions in the end because, because that's a geometric quantity that we can always exploit in these graphs. Or vectors in general, doesn't have to be relative. Yeah, right, position. we also use yeah. for, to encode for four sectors. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, indeed, this is a very good representation. Um, uh, Bahare, I know you have a question, but if it's possible to let them continue a bit the presentation before the next interruption, uh, you can ask maybe the question in the chat so someone could perhaps answer it. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I now like jump directly to, to the heart of our method. And, and I will be very, very quick here because what I think is more interesting for, for, for all the, the people here is then to compare like really this, what, what we are doing with what other people are doing, showing um, yeah, the, the, the small and subtle differences which appear and afterwards framing this, this whole um, slew of, of methods in a common framework. So um, what is written here basically without a lot of definitions is, is a standard message passing graph network. You have a, a message network, which usually uses some node information, some additional edge information, and then, then you sum up all the messages and, and you, 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 you use a node update network. We have these weird tildes um, above these vectors, which is basically our way of saying that these are steerable uh, vectors. So they are already living in the basis spent by the spherical harmonics. Um, and what is normally used if, if you um, use, use, use standard neural networks, you have a layer which has an input and, and an output. The, the way um, the, 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 the um, E3 equivariance is, is main, obtained in, in the network is by using the so-called Kerch Gordon tensor product, which basically maps from one steerable subspace to another steerable subspace. And this is well defined and, and, and comes from, it's also, I'm very well known in physics. The, the, the main difference, and, and I think that the takeaway message is that the Klebs Gordon tensor product does not only need one input to map to, to another um, output, but it takes two inputs. So it, it really um, takes not only one vector, but it takes two vectors. And if you if you think of the, the second vector as, a, as just a scalar with the value one, then you basically are very close to a standard linear layer. Okay, and what we are doing is also very similar to, to what other methods are doing. We are using the Schlepsch Gordon tensor product both in the, in the messages and in the node update networks. What we then realized is that if you're doing this, um, we have this, let's say this wildcard here because we can add additional, we, we, we have to add something for, for our Schlepsch Gordon tensor product. And the way we are thinking of this is that now we have the opportunity to add whatever um, information we want, both which might be relevant for the messages, but also what might be relevant for the, for the node updates. And now that there comes the point where you can think what might be important for messages, and this is what Eric already sketched in, 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 the, in the, on the first slide. So for example, here you can add relative positions, but also relative forces, or whatever information might be important for, for a message and which has some geometrical meaning. And for the node updates, you can really add information which directly sits on the nodes, like acceleration, velocity, um, force, or spin, um, angular momentum, yeah, whatever comes to your head and whatever is available in the data set, of course. And with this, I think it's, it's, it's time to, to start a bit comparing to, to other methods. Um, I will, in this, in this overview, only um, say two very general points. Um, we have like loads of, of slides in, in, in the backup, but I want to, to go um, for the, for the non-linear non -linear versus linear part, because this was basically how we started the work, um, because we, we looked at, at networks such as tensor field networks, Cormorant, SE3 transformer. And basically one can all write these networks in such a form. So if you, if I go back, 
um, and you remember we have this node update network here. And if we, we look at, at, at these, these networks, what, what they basically have, they have a, a feature vector at every node and then they, they update the feature vector. And the updating of the feature vector is, is done by a, a Klebsch Gordon tensor product. And these, these weights of the Klebsch Gordon tensor product, so basically all these connections here, are obtained by, by some um, um, layers or whatsoever, some functions which depend on this, on this relative distance between neighboring points. And afterwards, what happens basically, you, you have the weights of the Klebsch Gordon tensor product, you have the, the input, but the, the way you transform the input is very linear. Well, it's linear that you cannot be very linear, it's linear. Um, so whatever is happening here, or as we, we see in the, in the SA3 transformer in a very complicated way via an, an equivariant attention mechanism, is obtaining the weights of the Klebsch Gordon tensor product and then modifying the node features in a linear way. And, and this linear modification of the node features is something which we wanted to kind of to avoid or which we wanted to go upon um, because we were thinking that this linear um, modification of node features might, might be harm a bit. And so we were kind of going the way that the e GNN is going and we were applying an, a very, uh, a, still study again saying very, a nonlinear um, modification of these node features by using an, an MLP, which is based on this on this Klebsch Gordon tensor products and activation functions in between. So I hope I, I, I did not confuse you too much, but this is like very important to, to understand um, that concept. So I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions here and, and maybe oh, or Eric might add if, if you forgot something. I just, yeah. yeah. No, no, maybe one thing to add is that we are following here the very standard message passing framework. And I realize we haven't put this ex that explicitly on, on the slide, but the message passing consists indeed of creating messages between pairs of nodes and then aggregating them. And um, so you see that, um, yeah, you see that over here in the, in the first line is a convolutional approach. It look, very looks much look like a convolution, right? So we have a weight matrix that depends on a relative position or actually a distance in the, in, in this case. And the 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 now the nice thing is that usually when you're stuck to working with uh, scalar fields, um, then we have to obey this uh, isotropy constraint. It's, it means that these weight matrices, uh, so they're convolution kernels they cannot depend on some directional component. They have to be isotropic in order to guarantee equivariance. And we, that's a well-known thing of, um, well, convolutions. If your convolution filter uh, needs to be invariant to rotations, then the convolution filter itself has to be uh, rotationally invariant. And that's what you impose by saying, okay, and so does, it can only depend on the distance between uh, two points. And now the nice thing is when we then shift to this uh, spherical harmonic embeddings or the steerable viewpoint, uh, we can actually um, allow to work with quantities that actually we know how they transform under rotation. For example, a scalar value like uh, an energy or uh, an RGB color, it stays invariant under rotations. It's just uh, um, yeah, you know, a, a scalar value, an invariant. But now these feature values could also contain directional information. And therefore we can also allow our transformation to be a directional, uh, directionally uh, dependent. And we guarantee that everything stays equivalent to by using uh, the klebsch gordon uh, tensor product. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what, I, what I wanted to say. So indeed, in a special case, when you choose to only work with scalar values, so the spherical harmonics of, of order uh, zero, so scalar values, then we are constrained to only working with uh, isotropic convolution filters. But if we now uh, crank up the number of uh, frequencies, we are allowed to use uh, anisotropic uh, exploit, uh, anisotropic or directional information. Um, maybe, so th there is one, one thing. Um, there is this, this Nequip paper, which performs extremely well on, on, on molecule properties. And Nequip 
has has like has this kind of form. So this is a bit of a spoiler to to maybe what what Eric is is going to to say afterwards. There is um, there is like certain um, certain problems settings for for which this this, this linear um, is, is still working um, highly or is, is working very efficient and, and should should yeah be, so, so it's not it's, so we know from the computer vision field right almost everything is convolutions 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 and then uh, mixed of course with nonlinearities and even though these things they look complicated especially if you explicitly write out the Klebsch Gordon tensor product in the end you could still treat it as a convolution as a group convolution uh, that is it's just that we now sort of work with this Fourier basis uh, implicitly but this is still a linear layer right so we say see a matrix matrix vector multiplication and so um so it's interesting to see that um, with these linear methods, we can actually get a long way. And it's not, not that weird if you see of all the results in the computer vision field. Um, but what we show in this paper is that we can, instead of working with these linear transformations, uh, matrix vector multiplications, we actually uh, have a message passing function or a message function, which is an MLP in itself. So now it means um, the aggregation of information coming from all our neighbors already happens non-linearly so that we are not too dependent on uh, the, the activation function. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that that's also a question by uh, Shetanya. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for explaining so well so far. I had a kind of basic question. Um, so we, you've written that SEGNNs are you know, constructing messages in a non-linear way. Um, we know that we can apply non-linearities non like ReLU to the scalar features, but when we go to vectors and beyond, we we obviously can't apply like traditional non-linearities there, right? So, yeah. what do you what what do you mean by non-linearities? Do you just mean that the message is a function of um, the source and destination? I think I will answer to... that in the in the very next slide. That's a oh, very, yeah. Let's go to the next slide. A very excellent we'll question. That, uh, so, yeah. um, maybe maybe first say nonlinearities are one of the problems in steerable methods because, as well, you already as you already said. Before we get into that, um, because uh, I think this now fits better here about the Wigner matrices. If you go one slide back before we get into the nonlinearities. Yeah. Uh, in the in the like, can I just see this uh, a Wigner matrix matrix like a rotation matrix, and but now we have it for higher dimensions. Yes. And, yeah. Okay. Can you go back to the the, the slide uh, with the, yeah this one? So the Wigner D matrices are irreducible representations of the the SO three uh, group, the rotation group, or you can extend it to uh, rotations and reflections which means that they're like the smallest matrices, let's say, that uh, is independent from one of the other. And you should indeed think of these matrices D as rotation matrices. And they are precisely for uh, L is one, uh, they are precisely the 3D rotation matrices. So they are rotating 3D vectors. The, uh, the sort of the rotation matrix for a scalar is just the identity because you cannot rotate an identity. So now we already have two known Wigner D matrices. And then uh, for LS2, it is a matrix that rotates this five dimensional uh, vector. Um, so you see these five uh, glyphs um, over here. And it means this represents, so this is a subspace, a five dimensional uh, space, which if I rotate it, you know, every, everything else, everything rotates, uh, but I could still express that rotation of each of these individual glyphs by a linear combination of all these five together. Just like if I have a, a vector, you know, the new vector that comes out of it is a linear combination of all these uh, elements over here. So that's what these Wigner D matrices do. They apply a rotation to a, a 2L uh, plus one dimensional uh, vector. Um, yeah, yeah. So really, you should think of them as a rotation so the, the, matrix. The dimension here is nine times nine, and it has three sub matrices um, on the diagonal: one times one, three times three, and five times five. This yeah, but 
in like in three dimension we would need three numbers to specify a rotation right and now we have a three by three matrix but it's it can't look any way that the matrix wants to look because um yeah it wouldn't be a rotation matrix and can only like there yeah. are three parameters that we need to specify yeah so this g is still whatever parameters you use for rotations uh, so uh, let's say alpha beta gamma uh, it's terrible uh, writing with the mouse <laughs> but the same alpha beta gamma uh, are moved into all of these Wigner d matrices right so each d represents the same rotation it's just the way how you apply this rotation depends on which kind of object you're acting on if i want to rotate the sphere by 90 degree uh, around the x-axis it's not doing anything so it's just uh, multiplying with one if i want to uh, rotate this three-dimensional vector. Uh, I know how to do this. This Wigner D mate is, uh, does it for us. And the same for the, the DS2 case. Um, it's indeed, um, it's not a dense matrix in the sense there are like, uh, it doesn't have all these five by five degrees of freedom. It's still specified by only these three three angles. And this matrix D consists of, yeah, cosines and sines at all these elements uh, that are depending on the alpha, beta, and yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect, thanks. Great, great questions. So is it okay if I go to the non-linearities? Yes, you may. <laughs> um, so the, the, the thing, or the pro one problem with steerable um, um, features or steerable networks is, as correctly said, uh, unfortunately I forgot the name, um, is that you cannot just apply a ReLU because you, you operate in the spaces of spherical harmonics and you, if you apply a, a ReLU, you, you basically destroy um, the equivariants. So you you have to find ways to 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 work um, to, to still apply some nonlinearities because we all know that without nonlinearities our network is not so expressive. And one way, I mean, yeah, there are several ways of doing it, but one way, um, which is done most of the time, is by by so-called um, gating. And and the gating you can think of that for for everything which which has l larger than zero you you get a, a sec an additional um zero order era which you um put through an activation function and this um activation function or the value of the activation function you multiply the whole um era with so in in in, in this case um here we basically this one we can still activate normally but for this whole vector or for, for this whole um l equals one we, we need an additional activation function. Um, so an additional irrep, zero order irrep, which we put through an activation function and the, the output we multiply here. And the same that we need another um, additional irrep for, for, to activate this one. Yeah, so maybe something that I can add to this, for example, indeed you cannot apply, uh, for example, if I have this three dimensional vector, uh, apply a relative to its coefficients, because for example, this F, um, because then uh, suppose you have one negative uh, uh, pointing in the negative x direction, for example, it will be mapped to, to a zero uh, vector and you can no longer recover what it would have looked like if I rotated it and then apply the activation function. So we want to preserve equivalence properties, which means if I rotate this vector, the output should always uh, be rotated accordingly. And you should know how to do this. Um, now, then it, it turns out that the only thing you can do is modify the, the magnitude of this vector. Uh, that's, you know, you can, you can mess with the scales, uh, but that uh, I can still rotate it even if I shrink it to this uh, size. Okay, so that means almost all of these activation functions on stable field, fields are based on things that modify the length of these scalars. Now I can do two things. I just measure the length of this vector and then apply it some activation function to it and use that to rescale the length of this vector via some, uh, you know, uh, some activation function. Um, okay, so I can do that. An alternative would be is to let the neural network spit out another zero order tensor. So a scalar value that represents as a scaling, uh, well, a, a scaling multiplier for the length of this vector. 
Um, and that's what gated nonlinearities do. So they spit out a bunch of steerable vectors. And then for each vector, it spits out a scalar, a scalar which acts as a gating mechanism or as a multiplier that modifies the scale of this length. So um, yeah, it's, it's like a, a product wise or you know, a gated activation function. And that's also the one that we use uh, and that is commonly used with, uh, with steerable methods. And this activation function we use first of, of all to, to get our messages nonlinear by interleaving the Klebsch Gordon tensor product with gated nonlinearities. But we also kind of realized that when we're doing a, a node update, we could do it the standard way as it is done for basically convolution to basically um, sum everything together, sum all the messages together, and then apply an activation function. But by the, the means of putting it through a, a, an an MLP, basically, we again have a Klebsch Gordon tensor product here. And now we can inject in this Klebsch Gordon tensor product all the, the vector valued information which sits on the node. And in that sense, we can see that the, the, the node um, vector after the, together with the messages, is activated um, kind of with a new activation function, which is in that sense MLP steered by the that the vector value quantity is sitting at that node. And this proved to be extremely powerful, especially if there is multiple vector value information at, at the node available. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hannes, please say. Yeah. yeah, so how about how we're doing these non-linearities? What we, what we need is something that only changes the magnitude of the vectors that we're looking at. And now you're predicting this magnitude with an MLP. But now this MLP can, is, is, that, is that right so far? And uh, no, not really, it's, it's super complicated indeed. So um, as, a, as a very core tool, just like the convolution operator is maybe a core tool, we have something like an activation function. But let's, let's step away from the steerable part and just say we have a neural network, a graph neural network. And now to each node, you have an aggregation phase and then you have a node update phase. And usually in convolutions, you also have an aggregation phase, okay, the linear transformation of the neighbors, and then you do a ReLU activation function. And now what this message passing framework does, it says, okay, in the aggregation phase, I apply an MLP to all these pairwise uh, feature vectors. So that's a nonlinear transformation, but I could also decide to do a pointwise MLP. So I just pick a feature vector at each node pull it through an MLP. And this MLP is shared among all nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's now this idea of uh, applying an MLP to each node. Uh, so yeah, node-wise MLP. Um, we are going to look at it as being an activation function in itself, right? So it has an initial feature vector. It does something very nonlinear with it. Namely, uh, it's, it's transformed by an MLP and that spits out a new feature vector. So we treat this MLP as a very complicated activation function. Does that make sense so far? <laughs> well, but the, the input to this MLP that, mm -hmm. that first is just applied to every single node, this input is now some feature that we want to transform in a specific way, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so, a bit like your initial node embedding. Uh, if you work with molecular graphs, you often apply, before you do any message passing or everything, you just apply linear layers to your nodes, right? Yeah. Uh, but now what comes out of this network is no, no longer, it's not transformed in, um, in the way that we wanted to transform. It's still, a, it's still a vector living in the spherical harmonic spaces. It's just transformed in a in a nonlinear way. Yeah. So okay. So so the, uh, maybe I'll jump to the point of this sort of activation function viewpoint. Usually you apply a pointwise nonlinearity like a ReLU, but the ReLU could, might as well be an MLP in itself. Um, but the, the important thing is there. Usually these activation functions are not depending on the location where you are. They're just a pointwise nonlinearity and it, it looks, oh, okay. it behaves the same at every location. Yeah. But now, since we work with this clips gordon viewpoint, we can actually uh, make this nonlinear activation function be dependent on whatever geometric information we locally have available. 
because suppose you are able to attach a force vector to each node or a velocity vector, then we can use this directional information to, to steer the node updates at that location. Yeah. And that is and something that we haven't seen before. And it turns out that this is quite helpful to do. And because we, yeah, because the, the um, because the MLP changes in a specific way, depending on what, what location it is looking at, um, yeah, we include the, yeah, no, I still don't understand how this then makes sure that our uh, features are just transformed in a... Yeah, I, I okay. think there are two, two different kinds. Mm -hmm. The first is general um, gated nonlinearities as activation function steerable MLPs. So what, what Eric explained nicely is that, that since, um, since you can only scale the vector, you have to come up with some tricks to, or yeah, you, you're, you're limited in the way you, you apply this activation function. So uh, the, the, the gated nonlinearities is nothing else than an activation function with, with some limitations. Um, you can think of it just as, 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 as ReLU or whatever, but just some limitations. What we're talking now is that if you, if you have your um, your convolution operation, which has summed the messages. And now you want to apply an activation function to the messages instead of just applying a standard activation function, which can be a gated nonlinearity, which can be, yeah, it, it cannot be a ReLU because then we break equivalence, but you could apply a ReLU. And, but what we are doing is we, we come up with, a, um, with an MLP, which has at every node, this, this quantity is injected and can therefore first be seen as activation function, but secondly, um, depends on this, this node specific quantities. Okay. That did not help, I, I, I've seen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but. No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So uh, the, the gating is really, you, you should really read, instead of gating, you should read yeah. ReLU activation function, right? It's just an activation function that we are allowed to use on our uh, vector value uh, feature vectors. <laughs> That's a weird sentence, on, uh, on a steerable feature vectors. And actually in the special case of only working with scalar values, so L is zero, so only this uh, isotropic responses, this gating reduces to the swish activation function. So, and, and swish looks very much like a, like a ReLU. So we have actually that if we only stick to uh, isotropic features, so no directional uh, dependency there at all, we, the gating almost literally reduces to a ReLU activation function. Um, so that is really like, and then with nonlinearities, we can build MLPs, of course, uh, because we can apply a linear layer to these scalar values, followed by a, a, a ReLU, then again, a linear, then a ReLU. So if I have a linear layer at my disposal and a nonlinear activation function, I can build MLPs. And so now what we have, we have a linear layer at our disposal, may, name, that's namely given via the Klebsch Golden Tensor product. Uh, it, it's linear given one of the inputs fixed. And we have a nonlinear activation function at our disposal, namely a gating nonlinearity. So with these two ingredients, we can build MLPs. And so these MLPs, we are not limited to use in the message functions uh, of the, uh, the message passing framework, but we can also use this MLPs uh, directly to maybe apply pointwise, uh, you know, activation function or the update functions. Yeah, okay, but uh, like this applying it to, to node features, uh, like to nodes instead of after a convolution, this has nothing to do with um, the steerable activation function itself. Um, the... Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's a confusing that we start talking about activation functions indeed, because maybe the first place it's a, a node update function. So this phi subscript f. So in the message passing framework, you have a message aggregation step and a node update function, which is typically yeah. an MLP. And so that's literally what we're doing. We're just doing that this with uh, the, 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 well, the allowed tools. Uh, so we have a steerable MLP. Yeah, but we want, um, like there's no, now no difference between the MLP or the activation functions that we need for the node-wise updates and for the, um, for the updates after the aggregation. Um, well, 
the, the difference is that so um, these since we're working with Gap Squad and Tensor products, as, as I said before, we, we, we have the, the, the chance to use the second input, whatever we want to, to put in. For the messages, we can put in like quantities which depend on, 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 the, yeah, on the two nodes, they basically the messages sent with. For the node yeah. update, we have the chance to put in some really specific node, um, node features. And, and, by, and, and we can, as, as, as Eric said, this, this, this MLP can be seen as something which really has as ingredient for every node, these specific node features for, for every layer. So we, we can see that we have our node feature, which has this aggregated messages and which is now activated, activated by the features of which activation is steered by the features sitting on the very same node. Yeah, but that's a nice thing, right? And that's not what we require to make the whole thing equivalent. No, 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 no. We, we don't require to, to have this equivalent. No, no. Yeah. We, we, we are still equivalent if, if we just sum up the messages and then we're, we're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, but then you're stuck to just a convolution layer. Right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So this just adds more nonlinearity to the model. Uh, it's, yeah. It's a bit like, yeah, so we can make it more nonlinear by also having the node updates, pulling them, pulling the node features through an MLP that we do it in an appropriate way that is allowed such that if I rotate the input, the output is also rotated. And, and if you look at the, at the, for example, Cormorant or the SE3 transformer, basically they, they get the node update by obtaining the, the messages and and summing them them together and then yeah, maybe this is a nice slide it, it shows again um going from linear this is linear um well matrix vector multiplication or a collapse corner tensor product and now we replace this linear part by a non-linear transformation that not only depends on the geometric quantity and my node neighbors but could also depend on the input feature and it's all transformed very non-linearly via uh, an, an mlp and this is like the, the standard convolution is like a, a one layer MLP without any activation functions. So the, the point is, uh, and that were, that's what we show in the paper with ablation studies, the more nonlinear we make it, both in the message function as well as in the update function, the, the better it performs uh, essentially. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for the long, uh, for taking the time for the explanation. Thank but you I for this very, very good question. I mean, this is, this is a, it yeah, takes also some time to understand that. I mean, this, I, this is the, the, the key of, of, yeah. of, of all these, these, these methods. I hope it helped others as much as it helped me. Um, yeah, so the, the last slide is what, what we realized by doing this, especially by doing experiments on, on many different um, tasks. Um, so the question is always, if you come up with a new algorithm, what does it, where does it work? Where, where is it good to, to use this algorithm? And there are basically two things. Um, if there is quantities like physical and geometric quantities, as I now said like a few times, and also um, if the full connectivity of the graph is, is far from, from being tractable. For example, if you have this kind of, of setting, um, where we have a lot of, um, in this, this case, um, bodies which are interacting with gravitational force, and I think there are over 100 particles or bodies, um, using a fully connected graph will, will kill you. So you, you basically cannot rely on all this, this just relative distance information. Instead, you, you really have to, to make sure that locally all the information is, is um, processed um, as, as good as possible. And for this setting, so as, as we have here for, 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 for bodies, uh, for, for particle movements, where there's a lot of these quantities available, it, it, it really makes a difference to, um, to first make the messages nonlinear and, and second to, to steer the node updates with, um, with these quantities. And, and that's basically how we, we built our layers and, and how we did our ablation studies. So first by, by enriching um, the node updates and second by enriching the, the messages and making them non-linear. Non this is basically the, the setting and also the way our code is built to, to apply these this IC genomes. And I, I think that this was kind of the, it, it's very nice that we already had so much discussion that that was kind of the planned overview. Um, and I mean, we, we are, yeah, I'm happy to discuss further, but we can 
either go to the code or or um, Eric kind of takes over and and is is discussing um, the the relationship to, to to different other methods to to get the a grouping. So I think this this is this is a bit up to you. Yeah, maybe uh, I can uh, quickly show one slide uh, just to give give an impression of what else is in the paper and um, we, I, because we share these slides afterwards. Should, um, should I do the, the, should I go to the slide, Eric? Oh yeah, maybe that, that's a good day. Even like, just this overview slide indeed, that's fine. Yeah, so the point I want that we want to make clear in a section three of our paper is that many of the related works, they all connect on the basis of group convolutions. And there, there's this recent work, very recent work. It's uh, accepted at iClear by uh, Gabriel Ceso and, and Maris Weiler, who already did a lo lot of work on steerable group convolutions, and Leon Lang, um, who worked out the theory really nicely in a generic setting. So they, they show how, how uh, regular and steerable group convolutions relate to each other via um, a Fourier transform on compact groups. Uh, so that's a, uh, so we touched upon that uh, briefly already. The theory is, is kind of comprehensive, but the nice thing is um, that all these, so that's what we do, did as well. We, in a way, we stand on the shoulders of, uh, of giants. It's like when we were writing this paper, I, I took a lot of inspiration and actually theoretical background from the tensor field network paper, from the SC3 transformer paper, from the Cormorant paper. And you should definitely check out these papers and their appendices to get a feel for uh, irreducible representations, Wigner D matrices, and Klebsch Gordon tensor product. That, that really helps. Uh, just take a look at the appendices because, like us, we spend a lot of time writing these uh, because we also went through this process like, what the hell is going on? And then we figured out the mathematics and we, then we try to formulate it in an, a hopefully intuitive way. <laughs> and so many before us went through the same process and you read that in the appendices, like, okay, they put effort in trying to explain it. And all of them have a slightly different viewpoint on this. And our viewpoint on this is that we can all treat these methods as group convolutions in one way or another. And group convolutions are like template matching a kernel, just regular convolution to shift your kernel all over the place, but now you also rotate the kernel. And that re generates responses for every possible rotation at each position. Okay, and then there is. Sorry, are, yeah. are these, these other papers are also tackling the same problem of chemi in chemistry, or are they general? Actually, and... uh, all these listed papers here they test well at least on QM9. Um, that's maybe not the best uh, data set, but it's a good uh, benchmark for, for for testing your method. And some of them are really generic; they're not specifically designed for uh, computational chemistry. Uh, like LeCon, for example, uh, I think maybe even also tensor field networks. Um, there's some methods that are just generic tools, but they test it also on uh, molecular data uh, because that makes sense uh, to, to encode, hard code these symmetries in them. Um, yeah, so, so that's this, and, and I mean, the way we discussed them in the paper as well, and also in Appendix B, we establish. Uh, uh, hopefully in a somewhat intuitive way, the connection between steerable and regular group convolutions. And now the point I want to make on this slide is that any linear layer that is equivariant is a group convolution in one way or another. That's, that's really that's a theorem that I show in, uh, in this paper on, on Lie groups, but that's also uh, a theorem that is uh, I guess uh, Risi Condor and Shubendu Trivedi have actually also a paper on generalized group convolutions via these uh, spherical harmonics and uh, irreducible representation. That, so that's a fact that you should remember. If my layer is equivariant and it's linear, then it's some way or another a group convolution. And um, then if you map between feature maps uh, that live on a homogeneous space, that is something like a lower dimensional space on which I can let my group act, transitively to be more technical. Uh, for example, R3 is a smaller space of the rotor translation space. So you can identify each point with a translation, but we have this free rotation uh, that, that can map there. And so if you are interested in symmetries, so also rotations, but your space is too small to also encode for these rotations, let's say, then this imposes a symmetry constraint on your convolution kernels. And that's what you see in Schnett. So Schnett only depends on the relative uh, distance 
uh, between points. And it's actually a result from this theorem that uh, that's actually the most gen general thing that you can do. So in order to lift this isotropy uh, constraint, um, people have moved towards steerable feature fields, just like us, such that we can encode for uh, different rotations. Um, but you could also explicitly rotate your kernel for all possible rotations, let's say, and just build up a grid of responses, uh, but that's sometimes more memory heavy. Um, so yeah, we made a breakdown here of methods. Um, these are our group convolution methods. And actually when we were writing the rebuttal, we realized that methods like DimeNet and SphereNet could also be framed as group convolution methods on uh, what you call the homogeneous space of positions and orientation. And yeah, because, um, because of limited time, I, I cannot go into detail here. Um, maybe you can check out the, the, or rebuttal an open review or, or mail, me, mail me afterwards if you're interested in this viewpoint. But what message, what DimeNet does, SphereNet does, it does message passing over edges, over uh, edge features. And each edge can be thought of as having a base point and a direction pointing to its neighbors. So what you're essentially doing is sending message between local orientations, between a node which can be identified with a point and an orientation to another node which has a point and an orientation or another edge. And so this, uh, and that sort of puts it in the category of regular group convolution because we have a frame or a grid of local orientations all over the place. And then we can update node features at those particular grid points. And this happens super non-linearly. If you look at the diagrams in DimeNet and GemNet and such, there's a lot going on. And it actually makes a lot of sense what they do, but it's kind of complicated to figure out the diagram. But um, yeah, when we're doing this literature survey, I think this was the common theme. So we're either looking at regular group convolutions, which means no complicated stuff with uh, klebsch gordon tensor product, and, um, or we look at steerable group convolutions and then the machinery gets a bit more complicated, but it's also very, very helpful to, to work with these steerable uh, features as shown by uh, mostly Mario Geiger and, and Tess Schmidt uh, with a lot of work. And actually, Risi Kondo and uh, Shubhendu Trivedi should also definitely get a lot of credits for here. But these are really seminal papers. And um, yeah, also from our group in Amsterdam, of course, we have uh, Taco Cohen, Maurice uh, Weiler, and uh, they contributed a lot to this field of steerable uh, group convolutions. So that's the thing, regular for the steerable. And then we either use uh, linear convolutions or yeah, what we in the paper start calling nonlinear convolutions, things that are equivalent but are transformed more uh, nonlinearly. And um, okay, to wrap up, so generally we see um, going to group convolution improves results. So uh, turning on the steerability part, let's say, is beneficial and turning on the, the nonlinear aspect of things improves results and our method combines both, uh, yeah. Maybe if I can add one sentence, that the bad news is that that these methods, not, not every method works well for every problem. So um, for, for example, it's a different set of problem if you have small molecules where basically the only information you have is atom numbers and positions, and basically everything is fully connected. Then having problems like I showed here, um, where you have a lot of particles, where you don't have a fully connected graph, where you have a lot of information um, which you kind of have to, to, to send in, in the best possible way such that um, you, you can um, work or get good results, although you're not fully connected. So, so you have a, a di very different um, problem setting for, for ec where equivariant methods are applied. And um, yeah, and, 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 and we hope to kind of um, group them a bit that, that, that people get a feeling which, which methods to use for which problem. Because we also didn't have that, that, um, that viewpoint that when we started this, this paper. Okay, then, well, let's go to Tanya's question first before I continue. Great, yeah, this is, this is like, this, this is really like clarifying a lot of uh, confusions that I've had learning about this field, just starting to learn about this field. Uh, my question is, firstly, um, could you could you talk a bit about pain and EGNN and why you might think of them as regular, whereas you know they, they do explicitly deal with 
scalar and vector features they don't yeah. go beyond order one right but but they do have vector features yeah actually that's a, that's a good one for um yeah maybe you can go to, i think i included the slide on yeah so egnn only works with scalar features uh, right and that's and the interesting part is since we work we limit ourselves to work with scalar features we have to work with this we can only work with invariant uh, quantities uh, well, okay they, so they do update the xi's right with, oh which yeah are, so with, with, which you could imagine as vector features beyond coordinates as well right it, it is true uh, but indeed they what they do is they sort of modify the position based on the, these pairwise locations and okay. so they're not generating new so the mlps and everything else it doesn't generate in any way vector valued quantities it's just they use the exist existing vector like the positions or relative positions, and these are scaled with uh, some scalar values. So all the machinery is done with scalar values, but then this uh, equation four, um, yeah. yeah, is some sort of position update. Uh, yeah, right. Then... But 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 pain, for example, yeah. I'm not sure if I included it in the, in the slides. No, um, I think unfortunately not. Uh, I forgot to to add it. But pain. Uh, so in the overview, I I met. I, I, was wondering, am I going to call this regular or steerable? In a way, it's steerable because what they do, they work with scalar quantities and vector quantities. And you can combine a scalar with a vector just by scaling this vector. You can combine two scalars that gives a scalar. You can combine two vectors in several ways, taking the inner product, gives you a scalar, or giving a, the cross product. And all these operations that I just mentioned are instances of the Klebsch Gordon tensor uh, product. Yeah. Uh, so I would call it steerable but they it resembles so much uh, sort of the pipeline of, of methods like DimeNet and such um, because they limit themselves to only uh, scalars and vectors. They, mm -hmm. um, it makes it a bit more intuitive or convenient to, to design more complex update functions and such. So right. yeah, so I would say, yeah, pain is in, in essence a steerable method, though they do not explicitly and they don't explicitly need to talk about Klebsch Gordon tensor product because they limit themselves to, uh, let's say, LS01. So then the follow up question is you know, in your experience, do you need to go beyond vector uh, quantities? And when, when do you need this? And, you know, for example, in the results you show, till what order yeah. did you actually use? Uh, yeah. I think for this, it's depending on application, but maybe for me, a good intuition or how I look, like to think about it is that these uh, representation orders, they represent mm -hmm. sort of like a band limit on the functions, on the spherical functions that you're generating step by step by step. And so it's like in a Fourier transform, if you only limit up to some low frequencies, you can only represent core signals. Uh, and it's the same on this sphere. So the higher the L, the more detailed responses you can encode. But if you then work with atomic point clouds, for example, you, yeah, you have a carbon atom attached to four other atoms and the angles between them, they're quite big actually. It's not like you need to have this fine detail to distinguish this angle from this angle. So, so that already maybe intuitively puts an upper limit on the maximum frequency that you maybe would want to, to deal with. Um, but yeah, I, I, I but think- But on the other hand, if you have like yeah. some particles which are very close in speed and, and whatsoever mm -hmm. and, and, and acceleration and so, it might be to distinguish them apart or, or to, 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 to know if it hits a wall or not, you, you might go higher in, in, in yeah. I see. yeah. And so maybe, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah. So, so in, 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 for example, QM9 or OC20, what, what order uh, representations did SCGNN actually end up using? Yeah, so, so for, for OC20, we used L equals one because everything else was just too compute intense. For right. OC, uh, for QM9, it was very funny because we, it, it worked very well with um, higher orders and with very, very low cutoff radius. I see. And, and this is basically, I think, due to the reason that, the, the, the this, so the distance or the um, relative position between atoms is, does not have such a big um, weight in our method. It's not like that well emphasized as it is for for, for example, in Equip and in, in, yeah. in TensorFluid Networks and, and in that part. Right. Yeah. And I this think is, or, 
so and this might also be the reason why on, on data sets like qm9 where the, the the relative position is basically the only quantity you have yes. um, our method which is a bit more general is not like super state of the art i see that's really fascinating because often all these papers for qm9 will just process it as a fully connected graph right like they, they assume that you have all pairwise yeah. distances and as you start going sparser sometimes you you just your performance really suffers with something like schnet or right. uh, each yeah. gnn for example yeah and for for uh, us it was a bit the opposite we, we, we saw that even with a very yeah. very low cutoff radius cutoff radius of two angstrom it still worked very well but that was probably because um we were not depending on the on, on this information at all so yeah right interesting so so then that that means that scgnns might be more suitable for these very large systems where yes. you know we we cannot yeah. afford uh, that's, all that, otherwise complicated. that's what i tried to put here so of course this quantity is the response hey you're welcome uh, thanks for the questions um well that's a very interesting work uh, i have like uh, many follow-up questions regarding like well, what he said uh, and uh, also some other comments so for when you say like that uh, your method is not uh, fully connected uh, is it because uh, you have a function at a given node and when you want to look at the interaction uh, when you want to consider how it interacts with another node uh, you evaluate the function at that specific point or like why um, uh, like, do, do I understand correctly? What uh, is... so, uh, so it is still a graph neural network that can be applied on a fully connected graph, or you could apply it to only a locally connected graph, uh, where local means really spatial distances. And what, uh, what we show in our uh, ablation study is that our method achieves very good performance with just only, let's say, for, I don't know, the, the two Armstrong connectivity, uh, almost equally well as when, I, when we would do this on a fully connected graph. And the reason why it would work well, I would say, is that, for example, methods like EGNN, um, they only have distance, pairwise distance information. And uh, you need a lot of information to sort of figure out the geometry of the molecule um, by just pairwise distances. Whereas if, suppose, you have the relative displacement factors at your disposal, yeah, with only a few iterations, you would be able to figure out what the entire molecule would look like. Um, so that's a bit an intuition why it would work uh, to work on a locally yeah. connected graph. But uh, connectivity is yeah. a is a property of the data set itself. I mean, it's it. it I, I was yeah. just saying that that if you have a data set um, where you're far away from full connectivity, so meaning that that not every node is connected to all other nodes in the graph because it's just it would just explode computationally, then um, then then a lot of methods have, have problems dealing with that. But, but, yeah. but uh, we also, with your method, have the issue that it becomes much more computationally. Or yes. like the, in, in QM9, right, we, could we even use the full, full graph? No. No. Okay. That's a, that's a, that's a, a general, um, but when I said that nonlinearities is, is one of the, drawbacks in, in, in steering methods um, that, that this gap growth tensor products tend to be slow is, is the second drawback, I would say. And that's a reason to limit uh, the band limits to LS1 is already like in pain and, and several other methods. That's already enough because then at least you can exploit directional information and the detail that you're using is often enough. So I, I think we are getting to the point that maybe LS1 is good enough. But if you have quantities that transform via a second order EREPS, uh, yeah, then maybe you, you need uh, LS2, um, but generally yeah, wouldn't go beyond that uh, unless you explicitly work with spherical data where, and not all also with all the spatial bonds. Uh, but that's a different uh, uh, problem maybe. And can we then also like looking at something like SphereNet or um, DimeNet because they, Mm, kind of completely or yeah do they completely capture everything that we can do with that yeah that also your network can do in the l1 case i mean when when you try to to do 
QM9 for sure. But when you, you try to predict the, the force vector here at the next time point, they have they, they really have troubles because um, when you when you that's what I said at the very beginning, when you try to be equivalent with respect to vectors, um, this is something which this method are not tailored for. Yeah, okay. So this is again the point that um, during before we make some invariant prediction, we want to to transform stuff equivalently so we can, um, yeah. So the whole equivalence notion is uh, important because it allows for weight sharing, for detecting patterns that uh, uh, I can detect under this rotation or pose, let's say, and whether the, and if the molecule changes or maybe local patterns in a molecule, for example, a cluster of molecules, I recognize it as being important and it has this pose, then I can also allow, then I can also detect it in different molecules at, at a different pose, for example, equally well, uh, because equivalence allows if I, you know, if I rotate this to this, then I still maintain the same intrinsic representation. So, uh, so that's the importance of equivalence to allow for weight sharing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. But now when you're doing your molecular dynamic simulations here, um, do you actually predict like the initial, or you take the initial location and then you predict what's the status after 500, like after five seconds, or do you predict a force vector uh, every time step and then uh, update the coordinates? So in, in, in this task, in this specific task, we, we just predicted the, 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 um, the force or the, the um, relative position after a few time steps. But of course, if you want to, we just wanted to show that if you do some, some modeling, some granular flow modeling or some um, yeah, just particle movement modeling, of course, what you do, you predict the, maybe the acceleration after some time steps, and then you use this acceleration information to update the position. So, and then you can iteratively apply it, of, of course. Yeah, so, but then this would get really expensive, right? Because we then always need to uh, recompute the, like we need to change our, uh, the quantities that the, the geometric quantities that then play into our message passing, like in DimeNet or SphereNet, we would need to change the, um, the angles. And then we would need to yeah. recompute our spherical basis functions, and this, this would be super expensive. Yeah, this but this is a general thing of, of simulation is expensive. I mean, you, but you, you have to think it differently. It's actually very cheap if you do it with a neural network, because in in the, the classical numerical sense, you have the time steps are super super limited. So you have to to do a lot of cal calculation to make a small time step to the next state of your system. And with neural networks, you, you can make much bigger time steps. But still, after each time step, the whole machinery have to start again. You have to, to, to have your a new input. You have your new, um, um, your new, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. whatever. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Regarding this, uh, so this iteratively updating of the positions and stuff. Uh, there, there's a nice reference. So here in this list, you see SC3 transformers uh, by Fabian Fuchs. I think he wrote a follow-up workshop paper where he actually built iterative SC3 transformers. So then indeed you need to re-evaluate the spherical monic, so these displacement factors. And so he, he did this and tried this out. Uh, so um, this is then kind of uh, EGNN fused with SC3 transformer. Yes, it's uh, except for that indeed EGNN does this a very non-linear message aggregation step and the SC3 transformer uh, sticks to this pseudo-linear um, convolutional form. And I call it pseudo linear because it's almost just li linear convolution. It's just that it's augmented with an attention uh, coefficient. Um, but yeah, so SE3 transform, the iterative SE3 transformer is a bit like the EGNN with position updates. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, this is, yeah. Anyway, let's get to, to maybe some <laughs> other questions for first yeah. before I keep going. Yeah, and Dominique. Yeah. yeah. So um, during the evaluation of, of the function, to, to look at the interaction between two nodes, you evaluate the uh, spherical function um, at the specific position of the second node, right? Um, 
So, sorry, can you repeat that? Like when you um, when you do your message update um, at a given node, you will take into account like all the other nodes uh, that are close enough within the a specific distance to do yeah. the update, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, w one of the things uh, I was wondering here, like if we look at these spherical harmonics again, in, in the sense that they represent uh, the, the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, um, this, um, the spherical harmonics kind of represent uh, a potential uh, or a, an, an energy potential, but something that is also very important in physics is also looking at uh, a field, which is uh, usually the gradient of that potential. So I was wondering if uh, you uh, you looked also at uh, adding some other um, measures based on the spherical harmonics, such as the gradient of the spherical harmonic uh, instead of the, the harmonic itself. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Uh, so, so you mean if you have an energy field and you take the drift of, of, of it, it can be interpreted as, as maybe a force field that is uh, um, exactly. useful. Yeah, so here in this case, we directly predict forces, but not have them implicitly defined by an energy. But okay. yeah, I guess you could do something like that. Yeah. that would be, in methods yeah. like NAQIP, when they when do they do MD17, they don't only predict the energy, but they also use, since this is a conserved quantity, they they they, they use the force information. It turns out that basically for, for energy prediction, every method is doing this nowadays because you get a lot of information out of that. Because if you think of this, if you have a force vector clue to, to every atom, and and then you just predict the energy there is a lot of information which gets lost because the network just has to predict one quantity and uh, but like really knowing what is going on on, on on every atom gives gives a lot more information so people normally construct the loss with a like energy term but also the term which depends on on the forces if this answered your question i'm not sure uh, yeah, the sensors. Um, so right now, because of the direction, uh, like, do do you also have the direction of interaction between uh, two nodes? I guess so, because uh, by yeah. using the the yeah. different uh, fields. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think it's a very uh, like the the method that you propose is a very sound uh, from a physics point of view, and I think like that's uh, that's great, especially if one of the goal is to. Uh, to uh, replace or to help in uh, simulations of complex physical systems. Yeah, um, thanks a lot. Yeah, that, that was the, the that was basically the idea to have it as general as possible, um, because there is so much like um, systems out there which now need to be tackled by. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I would like to really see with the the paper right now, like you you have plotted at every atom uh, different kind of orbitals to show you in your figure one, for example, um, different different kind of harmonics. And one thing uh, I was wondering, for example, with QM nine, where we predict all these quantum properties, um, I was wondering uh, if you could also look at the function in the in the space in the global space, because right now your function is not. Uh, defined on uh, your atoms or your nodes themselves, they're defined in the entire space, and see whether the network has learned some kind of implicit representation of electronic densities or other important uh, uh, properties of uh, of molecules in general. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I've seen so a very recent paper, and I cannot quite recall indeed uh, the the name of this, but there are some very good papers that really build in this uh, prior knowledge about the chemistry and the, the actual properties that you're predicting. Because to be honest, I barely know what the task is. I'm just as a machine learning, I'm spitting out numbers. And then together with Johannes, who has more physics background and knows uh, how to interpret this. Um, but yeah, that it would be interesting to see how can we exploit these, um, for example, dipole moments. Maybe that's something that relates to um, higher order uh, tensors and, and those could be explicitly coded as such uh, whereas currently we just spit out a scalar number that represents this dipole moment. Uh, Would but, it be uh, that the papers you're uh, referring to are something like FISNET or SNO? Um, no, I actually have uh, something else in mind. Um, wait, maybe I, I can look it up in the meantime. Yeah, know. Rick. And yeah. With that, it goes without saying that thank you so much for, for being here and 
giving us these awesome answers and this awesome awesome discussion okay uh, thank you for having us awesome Thanks. this was certainly a really good discussion and i learned a lot i hope you learned a lot too if you want to learn a lot in the future as well join these discussions yourself with the links in the description where you also find links to our slack and our mailing list with the weekly updates on what papers are next also if you want to suggest the paper yourself you can do that in slack and i will maybe reach out to them if there's a lot of demand um, to cover that paper